Mr. Chavit, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'd like to uh, lead off by thanking uh, our ranking member, uh, Mr. Jordan, for allowing me to uh, to go in front of him. I have a, a noon speech that I'm supposed to give in my district. It's going to take me a while to get there, so I really do appreciate him uh, switching spots with me here. Um, in addition to being a senior member of this, uh, the Judiciary Committee for quite a few years, I also uh, serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee and I'm the uh, ranking member and past chair of the Asia and Pacific uh, Subcommittee. And in that capacity, uh, we both Republicans and Democrats on the committee have been very closely uh, watching, uh, observing, uh, monitoring what the PRC and the Chinese Communist Party is up to there um, and the threat that they pose not only to Americans, but to their own citizens. Um, and it's well known, as was mentioned earlier, I think in the statement of one or two of the uh, witnesses, uh, that the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party uses a vast uh, civilian surveillance network uh, to track nearly every movement uh, of every single person there. And there's 1.4 uh, billion uh, people who they're tracking. So it's a pretty extensive uh, effort that they've undertaken. For example, they force their citizens to download apps that monitor them. Uh, they track social media posts uh, to look for what they consider uh, to be negative content. Um, they uh, stop people at random uh, to check their devices for apps deemed to be uh, dangerous to the state. Uh, and they use facial recognition technology, uh, technology similar uh, to what we're discussing here today to pick uh, uh, individuals up that they're looking uh, for in crowds. Um, all of this uh, is a, uh, uh, you know, it's in order to build a so-called great firewall uh, between China and the rest of the world uh, so they can keep their, their people under control um, and, and to gather personal data on their citizens, which can be used to flag and potentially uh, torment uh, the people of, of China, individuals they believe are going to be unhelpful to the regime. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, uh, Ms. Frederick and Mr. Tolman, um, would, would you care to comment on the assessment you see relative to China, their use of facial recognition, other technologies to monitor uh, their citizens uh, and how the CCP is using facial recognition technology uh, to oppress individuals and, and certainly uh, various groups. The Uyghur community uh, comes to mind because they've obviously been in the news, uh, not nearly enough of late when you consider that uh, you know, a million people are in their, in their gulags. Um, and, and are there any lessons that we should learn from this? And I'm not by any stretch of the imagination suggesting that our government has anything like this in mind, um, but I'd like to hear from those two if, if we could. Certainly, thank you for the question. I'll begin um, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Pullman. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, we should say, yes, we have a system in the United States here uh, that matters, uh, sufficient rule of law protections, openness and engaged citizenry, a free press and an independent judiciary that act as guardrails for now against the propagation of technology for uh, political ends that are anywhere near like China. Um, but it is important to look to them, as I said before, they're the bleeding edge of using these technologies for internal control and internal stability. Um, they pervade a path for ethnic targeting um, in the Western region of Xinjiang, um, as we talked about, where uh, 1.5 million Uyghurs are imprisoned in re-education camps, um, often through the use of these facial recognition systems. Uh, but it's not just about facial recognition alone. I think the ability to integrate seemingly disparate data sets as they do in Xinjiang, um, they use something uh, that Human Rights Watch has, has reverse engineered. It's called the Integrated Joint Operations Platform. And what they do is they take all of this data, they fuse it, um, it's license plate readers, data doors, uh, these things that pick up SIM cards and, and all kinds of uh, biometrics, iris scans, um, uh, just all the, the digital exhaust that we're constantly emitting um, that people even in these regions are constantly emitting. They put them all together and they use this information. They use new technology, artificial intelligence. Um, this is one of the first places that they started using it uh, for political identification of 
dissidents, of Uyghur minorities. Um, what I see coming down the pike is the use of DNA phenotyping. Uh, China's already trying to do this. They're trying to use um, individual an individual's DNA to predict what their faces will look like. Um, they are uh, experimenting with voice recognition technologies. Um, and the idea is to combine all of this into this a digital panopticon and, and use it for um, basically an iron hand of digital control. And we have the technology right now to do so. Um, they visited some of this in Hong Kong, as we've seen the diminishing of, of freedoms there. You know, how does the democracy die uh, in, in full view of us? And China is using technology in order to enact it. Uh, we know that Russia is doing the same things when it comes to uh, pro Navalny protests um, in January of this year. So all of these things are, are something to keep in mind. And as Paul Moser from the New York Times said, which I think is, is something that I would leave, leave you with, is what China is trying to do is totalize control. They are trying to link digital reality with physical reality. And that, uh, that chasm that used to exist is growing closer and closer and closer together. China wants them to be completely interconnected. We have to guard against that here in America. Thank you, Madam Chair. My time's expired. Perhaps Mr. Tallman could uh, respond in writing just so I, we don't hold the committee up at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chabot, for yielding back. Uh, 